Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, bonjour, bon après-midi, bon nuit. Bon dia, boa tarde, boa noite, good morning, good afternoon, good night to all of our attendees here at the Jamaica Convention Center, as well as to you, the viewers who might be watching from YouTube, Twitter, Hopin, and the RP21 webpage. I am Dr. Reed at your service as main host. Now, welcome, bienvenido, bienvenue, bienvenido. This is the fourth and final day of the seventh regional platform for disaster risk reduction in the Americas and the Caribbean, or RP21. The very apt theme, building resilient economies in the Americas and the Caribbean. We are coming to you live from downtown Kingston, Jamaica. And I must say that on behalf of the government of Jamaica, we are pleased that Jamaica is the host country for RP21, the very first time that a Caribbean country has had the honor. So we just would like to acknowledge Acknowledge the organizers and the convening bodies who made this entire uh, thing possible. The Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development of Jamaica, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, or CIDEMA, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR. We'd also like to acknowledge our other partner groups as well as donors, in particular, the U.S. Agency for International Development, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, USAID, BHA. The Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC. High Commission of Canada, Government of Canada. Climate Risk Early Warning Systems, or CRUs. The European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations of the European Commission, ECHO. German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ. And Jamaica National Group, JN Group. Thank you so very much for your contributions. And of course, to all the moderators and all the speakers who have contributed over the last four days. We're gonna jump right into our high level session and we do invite you to use the hashtag RP21 and all the other hashtags that are related with this event. So the first high level session, HL4 is titled, Strengthening Disaster Risk Governance Lessons from COVID-19, and I'm sure there are many. The organizers for this particular session are the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, the United Nations Program for Development, UNDP, the Global Network Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Reduction, GNDR, and the Coordination Center for the Prevention of Natural Disasters in Central America, Predet Nenak. The moderator is Dr. Alan Lavelle, coordinator, show social studies, risk, and disasters program, Latin American faculty of social science faculty, Flasco, Costa Rica. Please do enjoy. I am Alan Lavelle, and as the um, presenter previously said, I am an associate researcher at the Latin American Social Science Faculty in San Jose, Costa Rica. I will be your moderator for this session, which will last an hour and a half. I will speak predominantly in English, um, given that a good part of the session will be in Spanish, so we can divide up uh, the language um, languages between the two. I may speak in Spanish where it is appropriate for the person who has to listen to what I'm saying to understand fully what is being said. Um, let me first um, thank the audience. Let me thank the organizers who were just mentioned, and I will not repeat for the sake of time, um, your presence in this high level session on strengthening governance for disaster risk and taking into account the lesson from COVID. I will begin now prior to outlining the structure of our session. Um, just to give a little bit of background information, um, which puts in perspective the discussions we will be having today. COVID has been with us now for two years, and we all know of its intense impacts on health, 
society economy. And the debates which now occur as to changes needed in society to avoid this type of event in the future. The event it's, as such has been categorized as a systemic disaster, the result of the construction of systemic risk conditions in society. Such systemic risk has come to the forefront in our discussions in the disaster risk management area since predominantly the financial crisis of 2008 and has been added to by such things as climate change, the Fukushima disaster, the Sandy impact on, um, on New York, and many impacts in the Caribbean through Maria Irba, etc. So the systemic nature of risk, which has always been with us, is increasingly highlighted. Our governance structures have in many ways been built up um, accumulatively over time as new preoccupations come to mind. And we have had more recently the whole discussion on, on resilience, which is still there. Systemic risk and systemic risk governments could be seen to be the latest of the preoccupations and which require a close look at our governance structures, our normative behaviours, our laws, our organisational structures, the intersectoral relations we have, the relations between international, national, regional and local um, levels of intervention and down to the community level. Um, and consequently, COVID gives us a chance to do that with a very clear example of a systemic risk disaster or catastrophe in the search to identify lessons, identify how COVID has unrevealed or revealed things we knew before, but which come to mind far more glaringly now because of the impact of this major global event. And so what we have today is a series of presentations and we're very privileged to have the presence of, um, of six highly qualified professionals who I will introduce as we go through the programme rather than right at the beginning. I will not present their curricula vitae in detail. These can be consulted on the platform. I will in which they've been involved when we're another in this topic. We're very fortunate to have representations from different areas of knowledge and areas of action that obviously should interact between themselves in the search for better governance um, um, response. And those come from the health area, where we have um, three professionals, from the disaster risk management or emergency management areas, where we are represented by regional and national bodies. And we also have, very importantly, because of the systemic nature of risk and its birth in development processes, um, a representative from development planning, development economics, which is so important for the consideration of what we're calling prospective risk management, that is not dealing with risk when it is actualized in disaster or trying to correct risk conditions that already exist. It is the idea of by challenging and changing our development practices, avoiding that risk is constructed in the first place. We cannot afford another COVID with all of the cost of response, preparedness that is involved. We must move toward governance schemes that do in fact open up the possibility of reducing disaster risk at the different levels in which it is expressed. Finally, in this um, brief introduction, let me just give a run through the structure of our, our session. Um, when I finalize, I will pass the word to Dr. Ciro Ugarte um, Casafranca, who is the director of the health emergencies um, area in the Pan American Health Organization, where he has been working for the last 20 years and I have known him for the last 30 some odd years in the practice of development um, risk management um, from a health perspective. Following his intervention, which will last seven minutes, I will ask Alex Camacho um, from PAHO to introduce the Slido concept, which is the way in which questions will be formulated by the audience and transmitted to our um, participants. Following that, we will then move into the um, session of five speakers on different topics 
The topics they will be talking about are guided by questions that were asked them previously, which I'm not going to repeat in the interest of time, but you will see from the organization of their responses, they respond to different um, um, concerns as regard governance structures um, um, in, 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 in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have good representation from Latin America and the Caribbean, from the South, from Central America, and two Caribbean islands, etc. Following their intervention, that will be wrapped up by myself. We will then pass the word to Alex Camacho once more to um, initiate the whole question and answers um, um, part of it. And then um, I will pass the word to um, Mr. PJ Kumar from the Global Network for Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Risk Reduction to give the closing comments and, and, and talk. So with more, no more ado, let me pass the word to my close friend and colleague, our close friend and colleague, um, Ciro, to give the seven minutes, and I insist on the seven minutes as being British, <laughs> um, of each of you, such that we can maintain the time for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, querido Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Alan. It's a pleasure for me to share with all of you this presentation with such top-ranking executives from different, from different organizations. Dear participants, in the last five years, without taking into consideration COVID-19 pandemic, there were a lot of disasters in the region of Caribbean and Latin America, and well, well, we have uh, the reason is that 73% of those disasters uh, well affected uh, millions of uh, people and uh, well we had uh, many million dollars in damages and uh, people who died but uh, since uh, 2019 up uh, to yesterday we have 5 million uh, people dying from COVID and more than 47 people affected by this disease. We have already vaccinated a lot of people also from our population. When we were discussing about this, and we had a lot of sessions regarding health, we had learned the lesson of 2014 that is what we thought. We had more than 30 references in health, including aspects regarding epidemics with the national systems of prevention of disasters and many aspects of the different answers to disasters, specifically uh, Sendai framework establishes the need of establishing governance uh, for uh, disaster response, but we haven't uh, still managed correctly uh, pandemics as the management of disasters. And COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that this should be addressed without delay with the focus of the whole government, the society, and everybody. The, go the countries that have prioritized legal frameworks, plans, and plans, uh, updated information to prioritize decision making and uh, clear mechanisms uh, for response at a uh, local, regional, and national level uh, have had a better response, uh, but uh, it is still complex. And uh, unfortunately, it will be with us during uh, several more months until the vaccination uh, covers the whole population, and this is a uh, 
reduced. Well, uh, detecting the disease was not our problem. The greatest problem has been and is still the difficulties that we are experiencing. At the beginning, uh, a lot of uh, adult people were dying in uh, intensive care units. And uh, the problem was also the availability and the supply chain of all the supplies that were needed to take care of patients and of the population. This hasn't been uh, solved yet. In addition uh, to all uh, social uh, pro uh, programs for uh, the sake of our population at large, we knew and we still know that any health emergency uh, has a political, social, and economic implication. The biggest uh, epidemic, uh, uh, more we in need of the interaction at the uh, highest levels of decision-making processes of different uh, uh, countries, uh, civil society and governments at large, including professionals, academia, and community. The uh, uh, health sector is a key in this, but uh, they can only do their work and control uh, together with the pandemic uh, and uh, work uh, all together uh, to solve the pandemic uh, and uh, all these uh, nat national, subnational uh, risks if they work all together. Systemic risk uh, makes an emphasis in the need of controlling all my multidimensional aspects that are cre created among the different uh, uh, <clears throat> segments at different geographic scales. COVID-19 has shown us that an emergency that started as an outbreak is now affecting all social and economic uh, sectors, socially and economically, up to a level that is still being analyzed. The management requires, of, uh, requires that the government reviews their uh, policies and uh, in many, many sectors it is necessary to have an adequate uh, uh, system. And I am going to emphasize adequate interaction among all uh, sectors, uh, including incentives and opportunities, as well as collaboration practices. Information management on risks is not the property of a sector or of an area. It is the property of the whole population. And therefore, it requires interaction uh, towards a new generation of more efficient alert mechanisms, the integration of reduction risk, disaster risk reduction is very important, as well as the implementation of Sendai framework and other indicators in the region, mainly related to the governance and risk reduction, as we have seen. So we need to focus the actions uh, uh, led to strengthening governance to acknowledge uh, the importance of intersectoral response on risk uh, on uh, disaster risk and uh, promote the response of every sector at appropriate levels only this way we will be able uh, to control this pandemic in an other thank you very much for the questions following this um, Gracias. Hello and good morning, everyone. What is the Charlie's interaction, and that is why we want to be uh, very in to have this, uh, to make this happen. 
a very interactive session. So please take your smartphones or your computer and go to slido.com. When you go to slido.com, it will ask you for a code. It is the code is HL for either upper cars or cap or lower cap. And this way you will be able to ask questions as the panelists present their conferences. Likewise, you will be able to vote on the answers for the questions that we will be asking. And then you will have the possibility, according to your voting, to look at the results of the questions and so that uh, as they are answers, answered. Thank you very much for interacting. You can also go uh, through this uh, code. And uh, please uh, join us and participate in the, uh, in, uh, the chat and uh, with the questions. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the delay every time I have to change from Spanish to English and um, on, on my keyboard and so that I don't hear the Spanish or English translation in my ear. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, maybe I could ask you just to repeat once more the code for getting into Slido, um, the 2021 part of it. Claro. Sure, Alan, of course, uh, please, uh, you have to go to slido.com and the code is HL4 and you can uh, go uh, directly through the QR code. This is important to mention uh, for those who are connect con connected to uh, hop in, you can look uh, at all the instructions and how uh, to go into Slido. The code is HL for either upper caps or lower cap. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I think everybody should be sure of how to get into the Slido um, consideration. Um, I will now pass over to the, the next substantive section of our um, high level meeting, um, introducing one by one the five speakers who will be speaking for seven minutes on a topic which has been directed by a series of questions asked previously to them, and which I will not repeat in the interest of time. Um, our first um, speaker will be Dr. Paula Dasa Narbona, who is um, the Under Secretary of Public Health in Chile. Um, she has an extensive um, experience at both academic and political level in terms of health, health emergencies, and other aspects of the health scene. And I'm very grateful and very glad to introduce um, Dr. Radasa for the first um, talk in this present session. Thank you very much, Dr. Well, regarding the strengthening of governance for disaster risk governance and lessons learned from COVID-19, I would like to mention something. At every moment uh, that we have had uh, during this one year and eight months has been uh, of a great uncertainty before the unknown and the dilemma of each of the things uh, that we have uh, had. Well, we didn't know at the beginning very clearly how we could uh, be infected, that there were people that were asymptomatic and when at March, March 11, it was declared as a pandemic by many countries, and finally it was well. Uh, change, it was changing a lot because it went to different countries at the day, at the same time. But we also had four things that we knew for sure uh, that we have uh, been repeating day after day. That in order to prevent this, we have to wash hands, we have to use a mask, we have to go uh, to have a 
social distancing and then the vaccine. Well, the president of our country on March 2020 declared uh, two uh, things uh, that are illegal and that are very important in our country. One of them, an emergency state uh, that, uh, well, uh, there is a sanitary alert also that allows the minister uh, the ministry of health uh, to make uh, some decisions uh, so uh, the whole state and uh, the whole government uh, uh, through the president uh, well uh, uh, could uh, do something on managing the uh, pandemic, for example. A lot of decision making was uh, made together, working together with the army to, for, uh, for uh, transporting vaccines to the different areas so that everyone could be vaccinated. Intersectorial uh, uh, response uh, has been very important. We see different uh, people here from uh, the different different sectors of our government who did a hard job to do all this and to manage all these together with the universities, working with the scientists, with the academia, with the health sector, so that the vaccines could be here with us. So we had a good control and collaboration with other players here. We have the president with actors from the university, from the ministry, Ministry of Science, the Ministry of Science to analyze data and to be able to make uh, timely decisions. And the other thing that is also very important is the intersectorial collaboration that integrated also. Uh, uh, a lot of sectors, not only the ministries that were focused on controlling the pandemics. We are talking about economics. We are talking about the Treasury Department, the Science Department, analyzing the, da the data at the army to protect everyone, culture, education. This was very, very important to keep on education with children. So the whole country was focused on controlling the pandemic through different measures. It is very important to mention the role of civil society organizations. They played a very important role because here we created a council that participated in a very important way, mainly providing recommendations. They are experts from the academia, from the science, from the civil society. And every week we joined with them and they were making recommendations so that everybody learned about the pandemic. And this was also very important through different uh, players, universities uh, and uh, civil society players from the different ministries also uh, were playing a role here, helping the uh, community as a whole. Uh, in uh, 30 seconds, I want to tell you that the civil society, uh, the army, the different communities, academia, the si people from science, etc., we were all uh, educating uh, people in a 30 minute, in a 30 uh, second message uh, telling people why it is important to get the vaccine. We had a lot of civil associations uh, telling everyone. Uh, which was the importance of correctly using the mask, of getting the vaccine, of keeping social distance, wearing a mask, washing hands, etc. So there were a lot of health crews that were well going through different neighborhoods to the schools. All of them focused on the job of providing a message 
research and uh, providing the risk uh, communication to everyone uh, through the civil society and the universities. Uh, well, uh, the president uh, uh, focused uh, on um, the uh, academia, on the universities, uh, with only one uh, uh, one uh, target controlling the pandemic. We had a great, a great. Uh, we did a great job together with the civil society, universities, and many other sectors of our society. Here, you can see how we could go to the different people from our society, the elderly, children, and many others. Well, thank you very much, and I am very pleased to share this this message with you, with all of you. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, um, doctor. Um, que ha sido desplegado en Chile durante estos últimos um, 22 meses. It is uh, wonderful uh, to hear uh, the great work uh, and uh, the, all the great Chile and that have uh, deployed uh, throughout your country uh, to manage and control the pandemics. It is a, a great uh, to hear that uh, from you. So, um, following that, um, I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Simone Geza uh, um, Beach, and I'm sorry if I pronounce names wrong. There is a very great difficulty in the English language of knowing how things are really produced um, um, pronounced. But it is very, I'm very grateful for your presence. Um, Dr. Geza um, is the Chief Medical Officer at the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Environment. Very interesting combination of topics and very relevant um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And she has been um, in that position since 2013, I believe, and has over th or near to 30 years of experience with emergency and accidental health issues in um, in, in in the island and elsewhere. Um, the floor is yours, um, um, Doctor. Doctor. Good. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the warm introduction. And I would like to be start my presentation. I'm very honored today to represent St. Vincent and the Grenadines on this panel. By the time the, okay, by the time the WHO declared SARS-CoV a pandemic in March 2011, March 11, 2020, the multi-island state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines had developed a relatively strong foundation of national emergency management and health disaster management. The NEMO, the National Emergency Management Organization, had for more than 20 years developed and refined disaster plans and systems for the numerous hazards and vulnerabilities and risks associated with these islands with an active volcano located in the hurricane belt. The NEMO had, tra had trained a large and varied cadre of responders, including EOC personnel and shelter managers and community disaster Sorry about that. Community disaster responders. The government of St. Vincent had established a disaster fund locally resourced for taxes on hotels to facilitate the financing of an immediate post-disaster response. In June 2019, extensive exercises as part of the Trade Winds 19 were held in St. Vincent, including the simulation of a volcanic eruption and an infectious disease outbreak in a shelter. Disaster risk reduction in the health sector had evolved. Sorry, not getting slides. Okay. Disaster risk reduction in the health sector had evolved and expanded to embrace the St. Vincent and the Grenadines comprehensive disaster management policy. The health disaster coordinator with the health disaster management unit had been established in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2013, and the lessons of Hurricane Maria focus on our efforts to create health-resistant health districts in our multi-island state. The National Health Multi 
hazard plan had been developed in 2019 with the requisite health assessments, risk assessments, and volcanic eruption, hurricanes, and pandemic were listed among the moderate to high risk of occurring. The highly infectious disease plan had been revised. In 2020, the Health Security Unit was formally established with the creation of the position of Director of Health Security. And the motto is, Health Security is National Security. In 2020, January, under the US aid, an emergency supply chain capacity building workshop had actually taken place. Next slide. And next slide, please. A recovery on March 2011, 2020, on the same day that the pandemic was declared in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we recorded our first case of COVID-19, a Vincentian who had returned from visiting the UK. By then, the NEOC had been partially activated to support the National Emergency Operations Center, Health Emergency Operations Center, a multi-sectoral task force of health services subcommittee of the National Emergency Committee, chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister, who is also the Minister of National Security, was fully functional. Exactly 14 days later, the Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Ralph E. Gonzalez, addressed the nation on the monumental, multidimensional challenge of coronavirus and its consequences. The Prime Minister identified measures to be implemented to mitigate the, act, the impact of the COVID-19, the impact on interconnected health, economic, social, and security dimensions, the HESS. These measures took into consideration the peculiarities of our Vincentian context and how we are impacted by regional and international forces. An economic recovery plan was put in place at that time. The total package of the fiscal stimulus and tax relief amounted to more than $70 million or in excess of 3% of our GDP. Social support systems were instituted which offered support to our vulnerable and affected persons so that we widened the, so the social safety net. There were grants under the promotion of, our, of the Youth Micro Enterprises Program and small business supports. There, were there was additional support to tourism and food distribution of locally grown foods in love boxes began. The aggregate of which amounted to $64.05 million. The Royal St. Vincent de Grenadines Police Force and security apparatus of the state activated plans to strengthen citizen security. The importance of lives and livelihoods was of maintaining economic activity was weighed against shutting it down tight as a drum. We never shut our borders or implemented a curfew or declared a state of emergency. Rather, a public health emergency was declared allowing for necessary amendments to the Public Health Act, which supported the response to the epidemic. In March 2020, from March to December 2020, we were able to strengthen our collaborations with the various sectors. On December 2020 to February 21, we had our first major, next slide please, sorry. We had our first major spike of COVID cases. Next slide again. And in April the 19th, the 9th, next slide please, we had the last of eruption where we went into explosive eruptions and the next slide please again sorry the entire national emergency system was activated the principles of disaster management kicked in and we were able to easily successfully execute the volcanic eruptions disasters the importance of risk communications was demonstrated by the general rejection however of most of the risk at risk system citizens, the shelteries to accepting the COVID-19 testing and vaccination, key interventions in the new COVID-19 component of the volcano response plan. Next slide, next slide, and next slide. Let's go to the end. We have learned through our experiences 
that there is need for a comprehensive disaster risk reduction to be integrated into all of our strategic plans. And as we stand now, we are rebuilding, we are recovering, and we are planning for our nine mornings COVID style in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, for um, doing a wonderful job in a very short time in a very multi-hazard context, which is a very relevant topic nowadays, particularly for small island states in the Caribbean, um, which have a series of conditions and situations which many large countries do not face. Um, so um, we will pass now to our next um, speaker, who is um, um, Claudia um, Herrera, who is the Executive Secretary of the Central American um, Coordinating Body for Disaster Reduction. Um, it's a very pleasant um, for me to be able to invite Claudia, who I've known for a long time. She has an extensive experience in the topic um, over the last 20, 25 years, very significant in the development of Central American uh, policy making documents for the region as a whole over time. And also, and uh, admirably, um, the first woman Secretary General or, or General Coordinating Secretary of Sepredinac since foundation in 1989 um, for the Central American region. Claudia, you have your seven minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, eh, Alan. It's a really a pleasure to be with you today. Eh, gracias eh, por la oportunidad para compartir los esfuerzos que me venimos promoviendo. Thank you so much for just sharing the time and the efforts that we have been coordinating. For us to be able to promote the articulation of the different stakeholders, territories, and the adaptation and use of the different systems that have been developed by our bodies and authorities for us to be able to face COVID from our body as well. We need to just conduct some sort of comprehensive risk prevention plan for us to be able to have an effective public policy to minimize risk. And that contributes without a doubt to defining agency tools, instruments for us to be able to enable an effective governance, improvements in risk management, also lead to minimizing financial losses caused by disasters and also ensuring the most valuable asset, our people's life. The efforts undertaken in our region just let it lead, lead us to know that we need to prevent damages and losses to, to the extent possible. The Central American policy focused on and, and, and risk also establishes that each government is responsible mainly for preventing, minimizing risks and disasters through cooperation, through the regional, sub-regional articulation supported by all of these mechanisms that are in place. During the different emergencies that we had in our region, due to the earthquakes, ETA, IOTA, and also the COVID pandemic had an impact on the social production chains. And we could tell that a lot of communities were ready to protect all our lives and also for us to be able to protect this valuable asset. So there is no question that through the development of these strategies, it would also be great to just have this type of community process and through this means we can also increase our resiliency as well. We know that our communities were the ones that had the capacity as well to react facing all sorts of issues and to continue moving forward towards this path of resiliency. That This is why we have significant efforts for us to be able to have a more resilient Central America and also to have other cross-sectorial actions that I am about to share right now. As we have proven already, since we have a multiple risk and since local government and the different stakeholders as well, also allowed us to just somehow address all of these characteristics in a more articulated way. Also risk management points as well. And also allow us to identify these global frameworks for us to be able to face these multiple risks that may be systemic 
at a diverse scale. And we know that our countries face more and more this type of scenarios. We also need to start allocating funds, developing reports on the strategies of strategies, resiliency. We need to work in the framework of other policies that are also included in this adaptation and mitigation of climate change that have been defined by the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I would like to share with you that from our bodies, we are also promoting along with CISCA. We also have social points and as well as everything that we have put in place in our countries. We have had monitor as well. And this is a good effort as well. We need to continue with our risk governance, public sectors, private sectors, civil society organizations, and the academia, scientific institutions, research institutions need to cooperate to mitigate disaster in terms of mitigation practices to have a key role, some actions that are also fostered permanently for us to be able to reach sustainable, resilient situation in our country. Our Central American policy is a regional mandate in terms of comprehensive risk management as well. And under this, we know that our countries have also developed our national plans, and we have also defined very specific points, such as a national risk management plan in order to ensure its enforcement across different territories. This offers added value in the processes that are also developed in the region, more particularly with harmonization and integration of the sectorial focuses. For some examples that I would like to mention, well, we have the logistics and mobility plan, cultural policies, college policies, gender equality policies, all of them have been put in place appropriately risk management in a, in a comprehensive way, nationwide as well. And we also have the different conceptual approaches. We also have more efforts that have been put in place. And I would like to share with you that in the framework of this COVID-19 pandemic, this risk management situation allowed us to identify that this critical point that our countries identified and our governments in management with the Central American management, we developed a platform for us to be united against coronavirus. We adopted this through the different heads of states. And this is how we started to take joint actions as well. We also declared the assessments and prevention action treatment of COVID-19. So I know that I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to highlight this cross-sectoral action that we have had in Comisca, health sector, for us to be able to develop risk management and efforts like the regional mechanism for joint action, communication strategies, the mechanism to strengthen mitigation response as well, for us to be able to enable our humanitarian assistance mechanism, which is currently being updated by the ministries of health for us to be able to face this type of biological threats. We have had health care provisions as well for us to be able to provide assistance in the border areas. We have coordination mechanisms as well as information and coordination platforms that allow us to just somehow work in terms of forecasting and preventing consequences of all of these scenarios. And also in terms of continuity facing the preparation and implementation of social security protocols facing this. And like I mentioned, this general crisis caused by the pandemic requires regional actions in addition to the domestic and national actions. And this regional action is mainly characterized and is known for providing supplementary support to countries. And we also have management through the international cooperation agencies. We are developing efforts for us to continue with policies and for us to be able to continue working with our mechanism and to face these biological threats through these processes with the ministries of health, departments of health. We know that it is very difficult because COVID-19 just really demanded a lot of resource allocation from different states and we know that we have doubled our cross-sectorial cross efforts as well for us to be able to face this 
health crisis. So my time has run out. So I would just like to thank you for just just allowing me to share all of my efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. And um, I do apologize for the time for seven minutes, um, which fortunately and everybody is keeping to, which will allow us a fair amount of time for questions and answers and maybe a wider interaction even between the panel members. Um, uh, thank you for the vision from a region, a region that is complex, uh, multi-hazard, one of the uh, um, regions that suffers most from inequality, marginalization, exclusion in Latin America, and where the complexity of risk is apparent day by day has been so for many, many years. And with things like the virus and the increase in climate change impact is likely to be a, a challenge for the future. Um, with that, I would then pass to our penultimate um, speaker, um, Sergio Rico, who is um, since 2020 the director of the National Emergency System um, of the presidency of um, um, the Republic of Uruguay. Um, Sergio has a master's in, uh, in political science, um, is, has done studies on strategic forethought, which is really critical in this type of topic, and is a retired colonel, so brings together in his own mindset uh, uh, an interesting um, series of different approaches to thinking about risk and risk management. Um, Sergio, the floor is yours. Buenos días a todos los integrantes de esta mesa plenaria. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I would like to greet all of the members of this panel. It's such an honor for me to represent my country in this exhibition and also to address these two points that our, our dear friend Alan has also provided us. First and foremost, I wanted to address our response capacity coordination mechanism that have been provided for in our governance. The National Emergency System in Uruguay is a public system, permanent system, which purpose is to protect people, assets, meaning critical infrastructure and the environment. As you may see in this picture, the executive branch runs the system through its secretariat. And over there, we have the National Emergency Board on national risk and disaster reduction made up of the under secretariats and ministers of interior, defense, energy, industry, mining, transportation, environment, housing, territorial structuring, social development, in addition to the president of the superintendent Congress. This national board is responsible, among other things, to establish the policies, strategies, standards, protocols, national plans to minimize risk and manage emergency situation. So on March 13, the board was convened by the secretary to assess the pandemic and get the report by the Department of Health. Uh, in turn, the president summoned all ministers and under secretaries so that they could attend the meeting that he presided. They declared a, an emergency. As part of our standards, we find the National Emergency Directorate, and among other responsibilities, it has to be the link between the PE and other agents that make up the system at a department level, also by respecting the autonomy and competences of each institution or country divided territorially in 19 departments, as seen in the lower right bottom part of the screen. Each department has a department committee presided by the superintendent as the highest political authority. That committee, among other responsibilities, needs to pass the policy strategies, standards, regulations, plans, programs, and department protocols on risk and disaster reduction and management in the territory. As you may see in this slide, these emergency department committees are made up of at least the representatives of national agencies that are part of this territory, the head of police, the head of the fire unit, the head of the army unit, the representative of the social development, public health, 
the Institute for Children and Adolescents of Uruguay, and also the public prosecution. And in the next slide, you will see the second question on lessons learned. One of the lessons learned is that risks and therefore emergencies may be global like this pandemic. They are also cross-disciplinary or cross-sectorial as well, meaning a sector like in this case, health is the main one which effect and impact are more prevalent. Therefore, we have other disciplines, other sectors that also need to conduct strategic actions to pursue the same objective. IT, communication, ITCs overall, and other lessons learned in terms of the use of these ITCs to collect information and communication. Data collection, it georeferences have been key when it comes to making decisions by looking at a map. And another part of this is communication, communication to the society as a whole on any of the events that may be taking place, its impact in the case of this pandemic, positive cases, recovered individuals, deceased persons, beds, and all of this needs to be very important and needs to be available for anyone who may require it. And maybe the innovation in this pandemic was the use of social media, a new channel that is highly important to convey this information. We had an experience in our country where tweets had an explosion because they were viewed from point 25 in February 2020, and we started to have 15.6 million views every 60 days last month. This pandemic also led to the need of using technology for students to continue learning. This is another lesson learned that has come to stay, science. There is no question that it has a special position in this emergency, in a pandemic, our expert group from different topics has been key to face the situation. In turn, over 50 experts with each and every one of them, and sometimes they would meet once every two weeks and also with the president of the republic and also the system manager for them to be able to make the political decisions based on scientific arguments. Risks are also systemic and also based on their characteristics. Territories may be cross-border or cross-border, as you may see in this slide, in the northern area of our country. When we meet the Brazil, we have several dry areas. There are no walls. And actually, we are united by a main avenue where we have citizens from these two countries coexisting their living. So that place becomes a binational municipality Santa do Livramento in Brazil and the city of Rivera Cabral had to take joint actions since the pandemic, of course, had no limits or borders and inhabitants had to travel just every day from one place to the other within a 10 block radius. So we needed to take this, what we call mirror actions in both territories, join our efforts to tackle this pandemic with human resources and material resources, but in a joint way. We need to continue developing binational cross-border plans to test them and also to increase and improve our, our relations with the authorities on disaster risk minimization. Thank you so much for your kind of attention. Hopefully we were very concrete. This is just the summary on how we manage our governance and our lessons learned. Thank you so much, Hugh, and um, you did keep within the seven minutes. I was going to give you eight <laughs> if required, um, but we are still well, very much on time. And Sergio has introduced a series of other considerations in terms of transfrontier relationships, which could be seen to be part of regional relationships, but have very specific characteristics at time, and a series of other considerations. Um, I had the privilege of working with Sergio and his group of people at the very beginning of a pandemic up till October last year and could see the professionalism which was introduced into the topic 
in the way that the uh, national system dealt with this at the very beginning and, and later on. So um, we come in good time to our last but not least speaker, um, Dr. Wayne Henry, who is the director and chair of the Jamaican Institute for um, um, Development Planning. Um, Dr. Henry has a doctorate from, I believe, the Ohio State University in, in Development Economics, has been present in the banking sector, has worked for the World Bank, and has a vast experience in, in the topics of development planning, development economics uh, over the years. Um, I'm very glad to welcome you, Dr. Henry, and the floor is yours for the last intervention of this segment of our discussion. Thank you very much, Alan, and let me say thank you just for the opportunity to share Jamaica's experience. Um, the first case of the COVID-19 uh, virus was confirmed in Jamaica in March 2020. And, and during the pandemic, many of the government-led interventions were facilitated by existing policies, strategies, legal frameworks, and other arrangements which supported disaster risk management. And these interventions included our national disaster risk management enforcement measures and those orders, the existence of a disaster risk management act of 2015 formed the basis of many of the government's interventions and actions during the pandemic. We call it the DRMA. It provided the framework for the declaration of the country as a disaster area and provided the context in which the disaster risk management orders were formulated. The order set out rules and regulations for removing or otherwise guarding against the threat or effects of the coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19, and the possible consequences. These included measures such as requirements for entry into the island, directions for persons infected by the virus, guidelines for all persons in public spaces, business, hospitals, infirmaries, etc. It also facilitated the strengthening of the orders with the introduction of fines to cover COVID-19 breaches. We also had the Ministry of our Ministry of Health and Wellness that had a risk communication and community engagement program. And so as a lead entity for the COVID-19 national response, in keeping with the COVID-19 response plan for the health sector, the Ministry of Health and Wellness launched an aggressive risk communication and community engagement program, as well as an enhanced surveillance program, what we call ESP. And this was implemented in accordance with the national surveillance policy for Jamaica, which serves to improve the health status of all its citizens by reducing the morbidity and mortality and associated costs of communicable diseases and class one events. These activities are governed by the Public Health Act. The COVID-19 social protection interventions, the crisis elicited a swift social protection response and the stabilizing effect of the social protection measures, which included cash and in-kind transfers, employment income support, waivers and extensions, among other things, served to alleviate the potential social distress, bolster job retention, cushion immediate basic needs impacts and encourage consumption. And this was consistent with our social protection strategy, which makes reference to the protection of residents from the worst effects of national or subnational crises, including pandemics. A number of interventions were facilitated under our program of advancement through health and education, what we call our PATH program, and that's our conditional cash transfer program, which provides benefits to poor families who are subject to comply with conditions that promote the development of the human capital of their members. And within the first few months of the outbreak, PATH beneficiaries who normally received a bi-monthly payment received an additional bi-monthly grant, as well as food and care packages. We had a COVID, we developed a COVID allocation of resources for employees, the acronym CARE program. And so in light of the impact of the pandemic on the economy and the general population, the government instituted a 31 billion Jamaican dollar, which is about US $200 million stimulus package, consisting of approximately 15 billion in tax cuts and spending stimulus of 16 billion 
In addition, health expenditures of six billion and public body support of $3 billion made for a total fiscal intervention of approximately $40 billion. And the primary response measure of the Jamaican government was the COVID allocation of resources for employees. And it was a temporary cash transfer program to individuals and businesses, which sought to assist with cushioning the economic impact of the pandemic. And it was further expanded this year with a budgetary allocation of some $5.3 billion. We, have some, we had some existing coordinating mechanisms which improved our overall response and recovery capacity to the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of the mechanisms included our Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, ODPEM, the acronym. They, had a, they have the National Emergency Operations Center, the NEOC, and that was activated in March on March 10, 2020, when the first case was confirmed in Jamaica. And they did a number of the initiatives um, overseeing the response. There's also at the national level, uh, our disaster management program is managed by a National Disaster Risk Management Council, what we call the NDRMC, and seven committees of that council. The NDRMC is chaired by our Prime Minister, and it's the highest Jamaican disaster planning body. And so the, the, our Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management Agency is a main body within the NDRMC responsible for coordinating the management of various types of disasters. And so the, the different committees engage, for example, our Humanitarian Assistance Committee prepared a COVID-19 Humanitarian Response Action Plan and Escalated Response. We also had a the Damage and Loss Assessment Core Team. Uh, the Recovery Planning Committee is chaired by the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and we led the preparation of a post-disaster needs assessment of the impact of the crisis. And the assessment was carried out by the Damage and Loss Assessment Core Team, which is made up of technical officers from various departments, ministries, and agencies of government with portfolio responsibility for the various sectors. And the team also includes representatives from civil society, from from the private sector. Uh, there's also the National Emergency Response Geographic Information Systems, uh, which comprises GIS certified volunteers from various government ministries, departments, and agencies. And they maintain a dashboard of indicators that display the current scenario of COVID-19 uh, infections and where persons were located, et cetera. It's an electronic database and provided real-time information. And finally, we had the, the National Social Protection Committee. And that's the institutional framework for our for Jamaica's social protection strategy. One of the main functions of the committee is the provision of a forum for networking and collaboration across programs and projects with a view to advancing a coordinated framework for social protection for sustainable outcomes in income security. And the social protection committee itself comprise uh, various actors and players, including civil society also and the, and the private sector. All right, so that, thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me adhere to the time restriction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Excellent, you did it again. But everybody, that's the first time I've been in a session where everybody obeyed the seven minute. Um, um, I'd like to think it's because I'm here, <laughs> but I'm not sure that's not true. Um, well, thank you very much to everybody that have brought to the forefront a whole series of differentiated considerations in differentiated context. I'm not going to try and summarize this at this moment because I think it is important to get to the questions which um, have been asked by our audience um, to the participants. And I will start by reading the questions in the order in which we have them um, um, passed on to us. Um, you have two minutes um, to answer um, in order for us to better get through one question per person prior to passing on to uh, um, BJ to um, close out with his comments. And so I will, um, I will begin with the first question I have in front of me, which is for Claudia Herrera. And I will read it in Spanish and English because it is so short. ¿Cómo deben funcionar los sistemas de alerta temprana for How do early alert systems need to work in case of multiple threats in case of a systemic risk? 
Well, I think the translation came over, so I don't need to, to do it. I've got a strange situation where I hear everything at the same time. Um, Claudia, um, I think if you got that question, um, could you take the floor? Hola, me puedes escuchar, que me sale un mensaje de inicio de audio. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I have uh, the audio signal here. I can, I can. Yes, turn, we can hear you. I can turn off the, the translator, sorry. Wait a minute. Okay. Español. Lamentablemente, lo siento. Las características geomorfológicas. Okay, the. Uh, Morphologic and uh, climate characteristics of our region are translated into a diversity of uh, climate. That is why our region is uh, very vulnerable and exposed, and we should be uh, uh, very attentive to all the hazards, uh, meteorological and climate uh, hazards. Uh, I would like uh, to tell you that uh, we are developing certain actions uh, to adequately address uh, early warning systems. We have uh, developed uh, an early warning system from end to end focused on the population and that is also focused on the verification list of early warning according to the World Meteorological Organization. And well, we are trying, of course, to prevent uh, that uh, to prevent uh, life uh, losses and uh, we are also working on this uh, to uh, generate uh, spread out and uh, to create early warnings uh, for our communities for our organizations that are uh, threatened by an event and that they can get uh, appropriately prepared that is why we have developed uh, this diagnosis um, that uh, will allow us uh, to uh, have all these to monitor, to forecast, uh, and mainly the possible consequences. We have implemented uh, through our platform coordination, monitoring in real time, and some others characterizing the uh, hazards uh, that we have in our region in order uh, to uh, prepare uh, for uh, the uh, response. But we are also aware that uh, in addition to go on deeper on the knowledge of all these that uh, might represent a risk for all of us, we are also working on the capacity and we need clear action by our governments and by our society and community and community in order to have an analysis and uh, and a forecast so through the platform we are promoting the view of alert warning in our region that will allow us to coordinate amongst others and among the technological and scientific community that will allow us to respond to hazards. This is an innovation and technology job that should be adequate to warrant the population an adequate response and so that they can respond to early alerts in an adequate way and to prevent the loss of different the loss of lives. Um, I will now um, pass over to our second question, which is for um, Dr. Ciro Ugarte. And it goes as follows. What is the accumulated experience to face new health challenges in the Latin American and Caribbean region? Thank you for that question. That is uh, uh, an important question that needs uh, a deeper analysis. But I will use um, the last report that the countries have presented to uh, the regional office of WHO in the Americas regarding the uh, progress in the action plan for disaster risk reduction and emergency preparedness in the Americas. 
one of the areas that they, the ministries of health uh, have emphasized for more than four decades is that the work in reducing the risk, particularly the risks that are originated in the health sector, are an intergovernmental issue. And this was emphasized in the creation of the emergency preparedness and response uh, program that was established in 1976. But after the uh, earthquake in Mexico and other countries in uh, 85, 1985, the concept of risk reduction was coined in the Americas. And then the Safe Hospitals Initiative, and in 2010, 2011, the concept of smart hospitals that is safe and green, and ultimately including several other issues, like for example, the inclusion of people with disabilities, or also including multi-hazard approach, and several other factors that are related with climate change and adverse events and others have been incorporated into the new uh, area of work of the health sector. But looking for new health hazards is also another perspective. The region in the Americas is one of the most advanced in the world in the capacity to detect new uh, virus or uh, health risks. But then it is, uh, we are providing with, to the world uh, global surveillance system with uh, more than uh, 200,000 samples of sample, for example, of the variants of, of this uh, virus and the pandemic influenza surveillance network that has been enhanced for the genomic sequencing in the Americas with many laboratories with in-country capacity to detect the new variants and also the inter-country work to uh, early respond to health emergencies have proved in many occasions that we are better off in detection. The issue is still on how we can uh, use that information and that capacity to control pandemics when they are more than the health sector. It has a multi-sectoral approach, and that is the link that is still to, to be enhanced in, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ciro, uh, for bringing into perspective a series of other considerations, particularly the thing of early warning, which allows uh, um, in some way mitigation pre-impact. Um, and also the whole topic of which you insinuated, but indicated very clearly of intersectional risk, that is. Um, the combination of varied conditions of human beings, which subjects them to greater vulnerability conditions when faced um, with a particular hazard, whether a virus or of any other sort. Um, I'll now pass on in the order of the questions which I have on the screen, which is for Dr. Simon. Um, and I'll do this in English. What measures have been identified from the experience of the countries? to reduce gender-based violence in the context of emergencies and other pandemics? Okay, thank you very much for the question. As we all know, the gender-based violence ex is exacerbated by persons being under stresses, losing jobs, um, feeling loss of security. And therefore, the major inputs would have to be the protection of the um, vulnerable and that was um, addressed in terms of the social um, improve in, increasing the social security networks in terms of we recognize so we had persons who came home from cruise ships who were no longer working and these are persons who initially were significant breadwinners and had significant standing in the communities so we immediately moved towards providing these persons with some support um, additionally, we increased our mental health and psychosocial support for the communities, for the healthcare providers, recognizing that the uncertainty of the COVID and then when we added in St. Vincent, the volcano and even Hurricane Elsa, the greater uncertainty, the farmers could not sell their, fruit, their produce and so the government set up a program of love boxes which allowed for the government to buy the, the, the foods from the farmers and then give it 
to those persons who are vulnerable. They set up also the small enterprise um, support so that persons could continue to sell on their trades because schools were closed so that persons could not sell on their trades so that those small income um, providers, those persons who are not on the national insurance scheme, they were brought onto the scheme. And by producing that support, we were able to, we think, identify and to um, protect those persons who might be in, at increased vulnerability to um, gender-based violence. In the shelters, we also focus a lot on keeping the families together and in terms of being in the shelters for the volcano, in the shelters providing psychosocial support so we could early, there was early identification when somebody was at risk. So I think it is a lot of the um, as we say in disaster management, you have your systems which are in place, but also you identify what is going to trigger, and so you put supports in, in place to, to try to prevent, and if not prevent, to be able to respond as quickly as possible. I'm not sure that's so sufficient. Much. Thank Welcome. you so much, um, Doctor. Um, and again, raising an issue that has been on the books for many years in different disaster contexts, um, which um, comes to the forefront as we've read often um, in the current um, um, COVID situation in many parts of the world. Um, I will now pass then on to um, Coronel Rico. Um, with an interesting question, which does remit to public confidence, I guess. Um, he dice, ¿Cómo fortalecer la gobernanza del riesgo? To strengthen risk and governance uh, when uh, nationwide authorities uh, can uh, hide information about what is uh, happening with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alan. This is a very interesting question. In the case of our country, we have uh, a national uh, policy for uh, disaster risk uh, reduction, a uh, national plan uh, for uh, disaster risk that will be uh, uh, published in uh, short and uh, some other, uh, like our uh, information uh, law that is is uh, very important so that uh, persons can uh, have the information uh, they uh, require at any moment, and everybody is entitled to that. Uh, so any type of information in any kind of uh, uh, disaster, like a COVID, wildfires, hurricanes, or uh, mountain eruptions, uh, has uh, to be given to the citizenship uh, uh, timely and uh, as soon as possible and in the most accurate way possible. Uh, that is uh, what uh, our state warranties as institu institutionality. And uh, it is uh, established uh, by our uh, government. Uh, this is a commitment of our uh, government. In addition, our system uh, has... Uh, an integral scope of risks and impacts where different ministries, entities, and uh, well, uh, other ministries load the information of any uh, of any disaster uh, risk, and they are bioreferenced, and any citizen can uh, look at different uh, visualizers, any kind of emergency. Uh, uh, well, uh, this uh, application uh, uh, started in uh, 2019, and then when the pandemic arrived in 2020, uh, uh, well, a lot of uh, money was invested and uh, uh, private uh, companies uh, uh, collaborated. So there are a lot of uh, tools with this application. And we have uh, a lot of bioreferenced uh, cases. Uh, there is information about the persons uh, who were infected, the persons who unfortunately died, and everything is there as well as the hospital 
occupation, at least uh, well uh, here, uh, our citizens uh, have not been rejected or uh, hidden any kind of information. Why? Because uh, we work for the public at large, and the public at large is absolutely entitled to know what is happening, because this is a way of uh, protecting our uh, citizenship. And uh, well, I don't know if I answered your question. Thank you very much, Sergio. I think you did. Um, I think it raises a very important point which goes beyond the limits of the question. I know that academic researchers, for instance, question why information on climate patterns, which is in official organizations, is not immediately accessible to researchers and the public, um, and you have to pay for it. Um, such things as the right to information, the right to participation, are very clear um, subjects which we could go on about for a long time. Thank you very much, Colonel. Um, and now to Dr. Henry, um, and I'll ask this question in English. Um, which is the contribution of geospatial information in disaster risk management governance? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have utilized geospatial information systems uh, heavily in in the response to the COVID crisis and then in the broad general framework of disaster management in Jamaica. We've, we've been including risk management and information systems more prominently. Um, I spoke of the National Emergency Response Geographic Information Systems, uh, what we call our NERGIST team, and that's coordinated by our Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management and the National Spatial Data Management Branch. And we said that comprises some GIS experts, uh, GIS certified volunteers from the various ministries, departments, and agencies of government. Um, they've maintained the, a dashboard that would display current information um, and the situation on the COVID-19 pandemic. We had an electronic database of records that was also prepared using information that would come from the, our Ministry of Health and Wellness. Our records include suspected and confirmed cases, uh, close contact persons, deaths, unfortunately, of course, and, and recoveries, source areas, whether imported or locally, um, and status of quarantine and isolation facilities. So quite a bit of information um, through our GIS uh, system. We, we provided support to the Ministry of Health and Wellness through the development of MAP products, including classified information that needed to be represented spatially. So, so that was important as we were mapping the areas of the country and giving policy advice um, to help to manage the, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, the team used GIS and related technology to generate boundary maps for designated quarantine areas, COVID-19 case maps, and the mapping of other critical facilities, such as the distribution centers managed, managed by our civil society organizations. So extensive use. We, Jamaica's, uh, it has been uh, participating in a pilot on with a, um, on a coalition of climate resilient investments CCRI where we are we've developed uh, with with help from the University of Oxford and and the CCRI secretariat and help from the green climate fund the GCF we've developed a systemic risk assessment tool where we are able to infuse risk components and risk exposure uh, components in our infrastructure development of the country so that's that promises is to be extremely useful where we are able to map and give uh, risk um, aspects and, and, and risk components to our basic infrastructure in the country as we map the country's assets and that will help in the financing um, uh, the financing implications of, of our infrastructure so we think that's extremely useful so we are seeing more risk assessment coming into the planning framework we are seeing more uh, forward thinking more trying to anticipate futures as we begin to build resilience in our overall uh, risk management uh, apparatus in the country. Thank you for the question. 
Thank you, Doctor. Um, in order to give the due time to the BJ at the end of his session, I will take one more question or ask one more question, which will be a question to the community there, of which one of you will have the opportunity to reply. So don't fight over it, but um, um, please talk if you have uh, um, something significant as you will have to say. Um, a question which is asked to all of the panelists is, what great lessons could you share about this pandemic in relation to disaster risk management, which will allow us to manage better in the future? So that's a question which maybe somebody could raise their hand and the first person to raise their hand we will take and they will have one minute and 40 seconds to reply. I see no hands. Um, ah, um, Dr. Henry, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Alan. Thank you for that question. And, and I don't want to take all the time. So if my colleague panelists want to share also, but, but many lessons um, thrown up and shown by the pandemic. Um, one is, of course, the need for mechanisms to be in place. Uh, you can't wait for the crisis to come and then you are now trying to react. So, so the need to be proactive, very important. Um, I think the need for information sharing, um, you know, in a time of crisis, you know, credible credibility trust is important and the information that is shared to allow for collaboration of the various actors no one entity can do it uh, by by themselves and so as information is shared it allows collaboration and buy-in and to know what is happening i think that's very important and, and i think the lesson of technology infusion that we we have you know those technology enabled mechanisms because in the, the nature of this particular pandemic had been where you want to encourage distancing social distancing you want to, to minimize the movement of people and the gathering of people. But then if you have to do social transfers, you, if, you, if you have to engage in community spaces, then the technology would have allowed you to do that without putting lives at risk or violating the distancing protocols, etc. So the efficiencies brought about by technology we found to be extremely useful. As we had to move educational service delivery online for a schooling system, then we realized the importance of technology. So, so many lessons, but I'll just highlight those three. Thank you. Perfect. And thank you, Wayne. We do not have time for another question. Um, I want to give the full time to Bijay Kumar, who is the Executive Director of the Global Network for Civil Society Disaster Risk Reduction. Probably the oldest and largest of the organizations in the world. I think it's over a thousand members now, probably um, more than a hundred countries involved. And so I will give the word to BJ to um, give us some final comments and um, in his four minutes space and I will have 30 seconds to close out everything. BJ, the floor is thanks. yours. Thanks a lot, Dr. Alan. It's my privilege to be part of this uh, uh, group of panel and I, I had the privilege to listen to you and learn from you. My name is Vijay Kumar, as Dr. Alan has introduced me. I represent Global Network of Civil Society Organizations. We are a network of 1,600 plus organizations and one-fourth of those members come from Latin America, Americas and the Caribbean region. And it is a real, real learning to listen to you. L let me just capture what I learned. The first one that I learned that the global pandemic was global in nature, but impact was local. So that all of us, we know that. This is what we learned from the pandemic. The second thing we actually learned, which was also uh, uh, underlined by Dr. Simone in her response, that like other disasters, this also had a disproportionate impact on the people. People who are vulnerable, they were exposed to this more. Women, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the elderly population, they were disproportionately impacted as it happens with most of the disasters. And number three, that we could actually very clearly see the systemic linkages, the concomitant relationship. If one is poor, then they were impacted more. If the country was poorer, then they didn't get the vaccines. So let's say it, it had a concomitant uh, relationship. But more importantly, the, the systemic relationship also resulted in bringing it a multi-hazard uh, linked processes. So there are other hazards which also made compounded the problems. And the last but not the least, that as Dr. Henry was saying, that it, it we saw that it is a collective efforts that actually took us, uh, took all of us together and technology was overused. Now, in terms of what the solutions that I heard from uh, your 
thinking. I, I will quickly touch upon the five solutions that I captured. The first, let's not forget to capture the analysis of the risk from the perspective of the community which is living that risk. So it is more important now go to those areas, the local areas, local capacities need to be thought through. And we need to listen to the uh, perspective of the communities who are living these experiences. Number two, as actually it was uh, Dr. Paula, Dr. from Chile, he, he actually articulated it very clearly that there is a need for strengthening the local capacity recognizing the local capacity and trying to see how you actually bring the collective perspectives so that the private sector, the civil society organizations, the scientists, scientists or scientific community, academics, they can work together at the local level. So that is the collective process. Number three, that it was essential that local capacity need to be taking on board the plans of the communities for building resilience. What, what actually uh, Claudia actually talked of, Dr. Claudia talked of that, that fundamental thing is building the resilience of the communities most of it. How can we all come together to build that resilience, which is actually important. So that is what we need to be oriented to the involvement of the communities most at risk, but analysis, the, they don't have the solutions for everything. They need to work with others, that it is essential that that solution is also informed by the, the various other actors who are involved there, they're involved in planning, they're involved in implementation, they're also making the other actors accountable. Number four is actually strengthening the national coordination mechanism. As, as, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Simon actually talked of uh, HES, the HES as an example of national coordination. And uh, Seriko Rico talked about the structure, uh, how you put that. And Dr. Henry actually talked about the structure, how you put it and actually work at the national level, which actually is coordination of the responses. And the last, before I give it to uh, Dr. Alan, is at the global, at the regional level, as Claudia was talking of, that you have to think beyond the countries and see how you can bring it together. I will actually put it not only region, at a global level, share, learn, and be effective. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, BJ. Um, we have 12 seconds to the planned finalization. Excellent. I would just highlight two things. Um, from all of this, the need for prospective management, that is avoiding this in the future. Um, we've learned from the COVID experience what was gone wrong with our planning systems, with our structures, with our development processes, and we can do something about that in the future. And the other is the integration across spatial scales where local is absolutely fundamental, but we must realize that most risks at the le local level is related to something that happens somewhere else, and it's out of the capacity of local authorities to deal with national land planning schemes, etc. Very short, um, my thanks, immense thanks to the organizers, to the participants. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And um, I guess we're celebrating the end of a platform meeting today. Thank you to Jamaica for all of the effort put into this. And let's hope to see you in Jamaica the next time. Thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Dr. Alan Lavelle, Coordinator, Social Studies, Risks and Disasters Program, Latin American Faculty of Social Science, Flaxo, Costa Rica. I thought he did a fantastic job as moderator, very engaging session. And, you know, I like what he said, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, to host all of the moderators and speakers another time right here in Jamaica in person. Now, I have a couple of announcements, but before I do so, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Desmond McKenzie, Minister of Local Government and Rural Development. Congratulations are in order, sir, to you and your team. Simply standing here with pride, Jamaica being the first Caribbean country to host RP, it's a big deal. 
Now, for the viewers out there who may not have the pleasure of viewing the, uh, the minister, there are two things you need to know about him. One, he is the quintessential patriot. So he is donning his Jamaican colors, his, you know, his flag, he has his green lapel, he has his, um, he has his pocket square, he has his green mask. The second thing you need to know about him is that he's a Manchester United. We all do make mistakes. Um, as you can see, as I stand here at the lectern, I am rocking my blue and white, which means that I proudly stand as a Chelsea fan. Hey! <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, this is day four. It's the, it's the last, the final day. We certainly wish that we could have these conversations, uh, you know, five days, six days, but certainly it has been quite a fantastic event over the last four days. So these are the two reminders, two announcements. The sessions will be available on UNDRR YouTube channel in case you missed a session or two, or perhaps you would like to rewatch the sessions. Again, they will be available on the UNDRR YouTube channel. The other announcement is that today we will have the closing ceremony of the media training Saving Lives, uh, and that will take place at 11.30 a.m., Access is available on Hopin, and all you have to do is directly click on the schedule, and it is open to the public. I take the opportunity to thank all the journalists and all the members of the media fraternity who registered, participated, and are leaving this event more informed and mindful when framing these conversations. We'll be back at 11 o'clock after this very short coffee break. <laughs> Thank you.